Welcome into the KSO Sunday Show. Mason Voth, KSU fan, Drew Galloway here with you as we are ready to recap the Sunflower Showdown. Whole lot better attitude for this show uh, than what I thought it was going to be. I was going through in my head last night with however much time left, okay, if K-State doesn't come back and win this game, how do we handle this thing? What is what is this conversation going to be like? It would not have been a fun time. Uh, I'm sure the three of us would have preferred not to have done it. We would have done it anyways, but it probably would have been more of a therapy session. Uh, instead, we don't have to worry about that because I think the three of us, uh, while we would have rather it been, uh, if you go back 10 years, 2014 was domination, 2023 was domination, you know, all the 2015, even the 2015 team kicked KU's butt by a thousand points. Uh, we would have rather have had that, but there are some differences now in how KU football is played than those teams. Uh, so we'll talk about all of that. And I think there are still some fans out there that probably need a little bit of that therapy session uh, just to get them right in the head and, and move past it, enjoy the win and get another year under your belt of getting to, to talk smack to your KU friends uh, out there or enemies, because I'm not sure many of you have KU friends. I, like I told Drew last week, I've got a limited number of them uh, that I would consider friends or people that I uh, respect, actually. So K-State beats KU 29-27 last night. 16th straight win over KU. Cats are now 28-4 and against the Jayhawks since 1993, which I was telling fan be beforehand, that is one of maybe the more impressive things that Bill Snyder did was he it took a couple of years to get on track and then just really never looked back against KU. And from 93 on, it has been smooth sailing for K-State unless uh, Ron Prince was in charge of the program. So uh, I'll ask you this, Drew. Um, last night's game, was that more of a problem with K-State, or is it more of a product of what KU football is now under Lance Leipold? I think that's just more of what KU is under Lance Leipold. I mean, we were talking before we started recording that I said KU has a bad record. I don't know if they are a bad football team. To have a lead in eight games in the fourth quarter and you only win two of those is – one of the wilder stats that I think that I've heard of. And you can see that KU is kind of playing towards the level of where we kind of thought that they would at the beginning of the year. And you've seen that post bye week with how they demolished Houston and really how good Jalen Daniels played last night. And he threw the ball in some tight windows and was running well. And you kind of got to see that, okay, that's the KU that I think that everybody outside of like, some people that are K-State fans thought that you were probably going to get all year. And, and there there were some mistakes for K-State. There were some mistakes for KU, too. So it was, I don't think it was either team's best game, but I think that that's just kind of what this rivalry is now. It's, it's not a – one team is pretty good and can get to that top 15, top 20 range on a pretty consistent basis, and one team being that, like, bottom – tier of the entire FBS and not just the power four we're now at okay one team is still pretty steady in that top 15 top 20 but the other one is probably closer to 30 or 40 than probably 60 or 70 and with that you're going to get games that are closer and at the end of the day if you come out of it and you win the game I think I, I told somebody today you can nitpick some things and how they look but to not celebrate beating your rival for the 16th straight time, I think it's kind of a weird stance. Yeah, I would uh, <clears throat> echo Drew's sentiments. Um, in the moment, uh, part of that third quarter, fourth quarter, where it felt like this was not going to go our way, it was not necessarily very fun. Um, and, and I was on the record of saying, I, I never want this game to be close. I don't want them to be competitive. I don't want them to be good. Um, I would prefer to beat them by 40 or 30 points every game. Um, but that just wasn't the case last night. I, I thought it would be more like a two-score game. Um, I think K-State had opportunities to make it that. But um, uh, it just wasn't meant to be. I think 
I think it does speak, as Drew said, to, to what KU is. Even though they're a two and six team, they're still ranked in the 40s in most metrics. Um, I think people have been comparing them to 2021 Nebraska, who went three and n- three and nine, and ended up in the 40s in the metrics. And I think that's kind of what that team is. That's that's a team. I think if they play at the level they played last night or close to that level consistently this year, they're probably six and two or five and three instead of two and six. That Kansas team um, definitely there's talent there. Um, I, I probably was most impressed with the way their defensive front played because I did not give them much respect going into the game. They had awful rush metrics. And even though K-State still ran the ball for 200 yards plus, uh, KU did a good job of making it hard for K-State to gain yards on the ground, and especially D.J. Giddens. Uh, Outside the 54-yard run, he had a couple other decent runs, but K did a pretty good job holding DJ Giddens in check. Now, Avery Johnson and, and Dylan Edwards in limited carries, I think, were very effective against KU, but uh, DJ Giddens was held in check f- for much of the game. Put K State in down and distant situations they didn't want to be in, which I think contributed to kind of the way the game went as well. So uh, give, give them respect, but it doesn't matter if you win by two or by 22. You just beat KU. Um, I don't think there's anything controversial about the win. There wasn't some fluke. K-State made the plays when they needed to down the stretch, made the field goal, and then got the stops against KU on their last four possessions. So K-State deserves the win. Um, maybe they didn't win pretty, but I, this this notion that K-State didn't deserve to win. K-State played hard enough. Yeah. K-State made enough plays. K-State deserved to win the game, and they did. Well, and, and also, I mean, K-State – didn't uh, K State turn the ball over less times than KU yeah. over the course of the game? Like, um, and, and you know, the and the that doesn't even count the fumble at the end of the game, uh, which doesn't necessarily count as a turnover because it was fourth down, it goes out of bounds. But for all intents and purposes, it, it was. Um, I, I think both teams for the most part made some, some of the similar mistakes that you thought, oh, that could have been costly. Uh, you don't want to do that. They were both teams were sloppy at times, but I think over the course of the game, K State probably played in a better fashion that you could decipher. Hey, that's the better football team, right there. Um, because I mean, the the Avery fumble is just. I mean, it's kind of a a fluky thing. Um, I honestly, I and I haven't gotten a good look at at a replay on it, but I was a little surprised in the moment that they didn't review it to see if his arm was coming forward and that they maybe would have called it an incomplete pass. Um, but ultimately it didn't end up mattering too much to K state just gave him a little bit more adversity, uh, and what they had to do. And I'll say this too, like this would be the, the, the notion to people out there that need to be talked off the ledge, despite the K state win. This is kind of just what rivalries are in football for the most part, like what K state did from 2010, until 2022 for the most part um, is kind of an anomaly. Like you don't get just 25 point wins every single time you go out there. I mean, what, since 2010, uh, 2010 to 2022 was 18 was the only one that was within a score. And you think about that stretch, like I'd walk out of K-State KU games where K-State would win like 31 to 10. And I'd be like, man, that was a little too close for comfort. Like, let's see, my freshman year at K-State was 2016. That game, I remember thinking, that was a very good game for K-State. They won 34-19 to over KU. KU never threatened after, like, the first five minutes of the game. But, like, that was the kind of game that I was like, ah, not very good. Um, K- K-State has been very spoiled in this stretch with everything. Lance Leipold has come in, and like many things we've said, he's made KU just – I don't know. They they do the the average things average now. Like they, it's not a, a chore for them to go out there uh, and and do just the little things right. And that's going to kind of elevate your floor a little bit more, and it'll make this thing a little bit more interesting when you've got all the energy and excitement going into it. And I do subscribe to the fact that KU was a two and five team going into that game, and pretty much realized that their number one goal left to accomplish in the season was only going to happen in that game. I don't think they cared about winning that game for the thought of, Hey, we could, you know, get hot over the the final stretch of the season 
and we could win four of our last five and go to a bowl game. I think the pure motivation was for that group of guys to go out there and try and take down K-State finally, and K-State was able to, to outduel them uh, after everything that went on. And I will also say this. I didn't bring it up, I guess, on the, the sh- preview with D.Y., but I, I said on Powercat game day, normally Mitch has me break down the offense and the defense, but I threw special teams in there for this week because, number one, history would tell us KU's special teams has been horrible throughout this 16 game win streak for K State. I mean, it the amount of times that K State special teams has delivered either instant points or almost instant points is pretty impressive. Uh, and I thought it would come last night. I, I thought K State would maybe get KU to punt a little bit more, and then we would see Dylan Edwards maybe do something there. Or I mean, KU had muffed two punts uh, the last two games before last night. So I thought that that might be something that came into play. I did not think it would be a guy catching the ball at the one-yard line. (laughs) Uh, But I'm very glad that Trevor Wilson made that decision uh, last night. So in terms of what actually took place over the course of the game, Fan, uh, I'll go to you first on your thoughts and reactions. Yeah, I I thought, you know, it's it's funny. You you go back and look uh, at the game and – there were moments where I thought the offense looked really, really good and KU really didn't stop us. Uh, there were times where I thought the defense looked awful and that we couldn't get a stop. Um, I kind of felt that way about both units probably until midway th- late in the third quarter because even even though K-State didn't score uh, on a couple of those drives, I thought really they – Offense looked really good to start the second half. You go four plays to score. Um, you, you have you do have one uh, three and out in there, but you fumble the Avery Johnson fumble. You get inside the ten and you have a wide open receiver for a touchdown. You f- really feel like you should have twenty one points on three of your first four drives to start the second half. Um, but the, at the meantime, we didn't seem like we could stop KU. They just kept moving the ball, making plays. Jalen da- Daniels made plays. Um, two third down and long situations where KU gets a, what a 34 and 28 yard touchdown run or 24 and 28 yard touchdown run. Um, so, so it kind of felt like, man, it's going to be the offense going to have to, to carry this thing. And then down the stretch, it was the offense couldn't do much. And then all of a sudden the defense is getting stops and the defense forced the turnover that led to K-State's field goal. And even that drive didn't look real pretty for K-State. They got just enough yards to get Chris Tennant in, fit, in position to make that 51-yard field goal. So the end of the game, it seemed like it really flipped where both defenses stepped up. And I'd say through three quarters or so, both offenses were in control of the game. And then it just was a ma- matter of who was going to make that last defensive play, and that happened to be K-State in this game. Um, in fact, made more than one play to win this game. So. It's hard to say. I mean, both teams finished at 2.25 points per drive. It's one of those games where both teams were exactly at 2.25, but because of the safety, uh, you have the difference maker. And, and KU also left a point on the board by bonging a, field goal, a PAT off the upright as well. Not that that would have made a difference in a two-point game, but I, it's, it's hard to jumble all those together because I can see where people are saying, well, the defense costs us the game and the offense costs us the game. Really – they both made enough plays for us to win it. They both also made probably enough plays for us to lose it. Yeah. At the end of the I, day, they got it done. I was gonna I was gonna ask you then for for your thoughts on this because I think a lot of people, excuse me, uh will want to talk about Connor Riley. I get the vibe from this game that at, that uh that the offense had the opportunity to do some of the things. And they just made execution errors. Yeah. Whereas I don't know that this was on Connor Riley for what took place. <laughs> no, I, I I got you. Um, I I thought you know if you want to question, I think some of maybe the play calls on those last three drives where K State kind of couldn't find that rhythm they were getting early in the game. The maybe third and some, twenty felt kind of stupid. Yeah, maybe some of the runs when they when they ran it when they threw it. Um, I, I could see you nitpicking some of those. Um, but for the most part, I thought he had the offense in a rhythm. I thought he really had the offense going 
in those middle two drives, sandwiching the safety, and to start the second half. I really thought there were lots of good things, and I and I would say the offense should have scored, you know, five touchdowns in this game instead of three at, at minimum. So that that would be your disappointment. But I, I agree with you. I think they got to situations where they didn't execute, and the fumble and the missed opportunity for the touchdown uh, that they had to settle for the field goal would be the two prime examples of that. But I think people came in thinking KU's defense was pretty bad, and they were. I don't think they were a very good defense. I think the season will show that out. And they played better against us than they had for most of the season. So I think that's where some of the hyperbole is coming from fans because they, they I think, rightly assess KU's defense. And the KU's defense played better than we thought they would. And, I mean, some of that also comes to KU had a couple of their – there were guys up front back a little bit more, more of the, yeah. the D line and linebackers. They were still without some of the safeties, but the safeties are kind of an irrelevant part of their story this year. But like Barry Hill was back in there. Wheeler yeah. was back in there. Um, so that was probably a little bit more significant. I'll go to Drew in just a second. You, you mentioned um, the, the non-touchdown to Will Ancio and drop ball there. I want to give credit to Chris Kleiman and K-State for – being patient and taking the field goal there. And this is something that Chris Kleiman has kind of showcased over his career is he's always going to go back to trusting his defense, no matter what they've shown over the course of the game, because settling for the field goal right there and having the confidence that you would do it gave you the opportunity to not have to be so stressed about when you went out and you thought, okay, we trust Chris Tennant to settle for a 50 yard field goal or 51 yards is what it ended up being I, Chris Kleiman deserves a lot of credit in that s- sense of how he managed this game and handled things. Uh, because I know that there are times where people want to point out, Oh, they did this wrong. They did this poorly. The way he handled that, uh, that directly led to case that winning that game last night. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point. I think, you know, <laughs> and as a fan, I, you know, even not trying, I'm usually super optimistic when we settled for the field goal, I I was not optimistic. Like, but I get your point. I think it was, you know, hindsight obviously is 2020 at this point. It was the right decision because it did remove that room for error that you had to go get a touchdown in case they could win it in the field goal, and they did. I, I wonder if too the the decision to kick that field goal is because K State had a touchdown play called on first down and third down and didn't convert on either of those and like what what are the odds you're going to dial up a third touchdown play in a drive? It's true. Yeah. No. It's 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 a good point. Also, um, that same stretch and situation. Uh, think about Dylan Edwards getting tackled at the eleven, and I will contend that K State has to lead the country in drives that end up getting uh the sticks moved to where they started either like the third between like the the eight and the 13 yard line so you have a bunch of first and long situations and you, you're not really going to pick up that first down so it's like four down territory from one point it's uh k-state always seems to find themselves in a, a tricky spot there uh, all right drew your thoughts on last night's game some of the things that stand out to you uh the good the bad and the special teams the the thing that I think stands out to me the most is that the, the game kind of played out how we kind of said that it would on Monday, Mason. It was like KU's defense is pretty porous, but they have their moments where they can be pretty decent. Uh, but the thing that has really hurt them all season long has been the big play. In case they had eight mm-hmm. plays go for 20 plus guards uh, yesterday. And, and again, I didn't enjoy how the defense for K-State played for most of the game. I don't even want to go look at some of the texts that I was saying about the K-State defense during the game. But you look at it, and K-State was the one that limited the big plays. K only had two plays go for 20-plus yards. You do have you do have the two really frustrating ones where it's a third and long, and they break it for a 30-yard run and score a touchdown. But for the most part, the K-State defense didn't allow the big play. They have everything in front. The tackling was really bad. And the special teams was such a mixed bag, but it was still better than KU's special teams that that you really don't know how to feel either because, you know, you you have KU's special teams essentially gives up two points and it leaves another point out there. But then you have K-State 
kicking the ball out of bounds once, uh, and then having a really bad punt. And, and even the, the the snap on the Chris Tennant kick wasn't great. So you kind of had a little bit of a mixed bag, but you still feel a lot better than KU does special teams wise. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out that was just an oddity that Mason pointed out uh, was that that's three years in a row where K-State has had a two point play against KU with the intentional running safety in 22, the blocked PAT return last year, and then the safety this year. So I think that's kind of fun, and I'm, I'm excited to see what next year brings in that that to that. Uh, the other thing that I'll say that is it hasn't, like, bothered me, but it's just made me laugh is that, like, the, the post-game commentary the last three years has been that the, the gap between K-State and KU is closing, and, like, yes, it is. But when you say that three years in a row and the same team continues to win, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's closing that big. Well, and, you know, the the gap can only close so much from, like, where KU was. Like, it's easy to start closing a big gap, you know, like, and, but it's that last little yeah, bit I, to actually I, get the door closed. I, I remember the, the commentary in 22, that was a 20 point game and KU fans are like, yep, the gap is closing. I mean, I, my, I, there were after the 2021 game, uh, I, I can remember people that are directly close to the situation. Like I was there when, when Stan Weber said to David Lawrence in the radio booth after the game, like, Oh, you can tell you guys are a much better football team, like all this other stuff. Uh, and and look, it, it is true, like, and we've seen it play out. But this KU team is just there; they they don't have it fully there yet. And at some point, and I'll keep saying this about them, we know that they have some talent. Like they are still made up of the team that a lot of people had at least finishing in the top five or six of the Big Twelve this year. But at some point when you lose every one of your games in the exact same fashion, that is a greater reflection of something on your team. I don't know if it's Lance Leipold. I don't know if it's, you know, who your quarterback is or what, uh, but you have something that's a serious problem. Like this is just not the world's worst luck that's causing this to happen. This is something that you have going on that you have to get down to the bottom of. Like I heard some of the, the KU beat people last night when I was finishing up. Uh, some editing things uh, in the press box, like 12 30, 12 45 in the morning. And I, so I don't know if this is right, but this is what one of them said that, you know, KU has had all these situations where they've had the ball at the end of the game, down a score or less, trying to go downfield. And you think about the Illinois game, ended with a turnover, pretty sure an interception. UNLV game, I think also ended with a turnover. K State game ends with a fumble. Um, Arizona State, did that one end with a pick or maybe just an income, whatever? But none of these drives have even made it to the 50 yard line for KU. Mm-hmm. Like they haven't even be, been able to cross midfield on these last drives, which is so strange, especially when you consider last night's game, where for the first three quarters of the game, if KU wanted to get to the 50 yard line, they were getting the 50 yard line. They could normally do it on like one and a half plays. So uh, they got something going on there. And I'm glad that uh, it continued to happen last night uh, as K State won 29 to 27. Uh, where where sh- should the defensive thoughts go after this game? Because they didn't get to Jalen Daniels all that much until late when they brought some of the pressure, but it didn't feel like he was ever really taxed throughout the game. He was able to evade them, and then. Uh, as we know, the secondary kind of continued their struggles that they've had most of the season. So, Drew, uh, I'll let you leave off here talking about the defense and their performance last night and where your faith in them is moving forward over the next four games of the regular season. Yeah, I probably need some soul-searching still, especially in the, the secondary, because they're just far too often guys are not in the right position or – are in position but not making a play. Uh, but you still you still look in case eight is fourth in the Big Twelve and points per drive allowed. So they're they're doing something right. It's just it just doesn't look pretty. And, and I think that that's what is so frustrating is that they're so good about not allowing the big play, but they're bad at 
not allowing like the third and eight play to get nine yards that I think that that is what makes it so frustrating as, as fans. And, and for us is like, okay, you're, you're doing a, you're doing something right by getting them in at these third and longs or third and mediums, but you can't get off the field and you're also not allowing the big play. Uh, but there is a sense of confidence a little bit from me because it, it seems like this defense can make their own big play better than they could last year. And very similar to the 2022 aspect where if they need a big play, it seems like they keep making it. You had a pick six last week with the Marquis Siegel. You had a pick at the end of the first half of this week for Siegel. And then Austin Romain makes that play. Romain made a play against Tulane. Uh, so when they have needed the big plays, it seems like the defense has been able to make the play. But overall, you want a little bit more consistency. Yeah, I would. I would. A uh, couple things. Number one, you, you saw some some kinks in the armor armor for the rush defense. Um, Ku, uh, not counting sacks, end of the game with two hundred five yards rushing on thirty two carries on run plays only. That's over six yards of carry and a forty three percent, forty four percent success rate. That's not. Great, and that's not the standard that this rush defense has has been at uh, most of the season. Um, my, my other concern is usually K State's mo has been kind of buckled down inside the forty, inside the red zone. K State got inside our forty four times and scored four touchdowns. And uh, usually K State's pretty good at holding at least one or two of those to field goals, and that didn't happen against KU in this game. So. Those would be the main two things. Um, and then you just don't see um, K-State got the interception, made the play. K-State forced a couple fumbles. Um, but the havoc rate, I believe, in this game was only about 11%. Um, and and havoc's a twofold thing. Havoc's making tackles for loss and forced fumbles and plays around the line of scrimmage usually. But havoc is also – Plat passes broken up, and K State is not a team that bra- breaks up many passes in the secondary, or knocks down any passes at the line of scrimmage this season. Uh, last year's team, I think, uh, was was better at both of those, and we haven't seen those pass breakups from this team, which which is really one of the areas where they lack in havoc in creating those those big plays that the defense really feeds off of. Uh, they're getting the pressure on the quarterback when they need to at times, and and getting some sacks, but. Uh, have a great scoring inside the red zone and inside the 40. And then the rush defense are three things that I think you would have concerns of after this game. Yeah. I just, you, you would have liked to have been able to get a little bit more pressure there. Cause the, you felt like, I know that the KU offensive line has been better this year, but I've seen some moments where they've really shrunk now to, you know, kind of the credit of how K-State did things. Um, a lot of those were I've, I've paid greater attention as late in the game where maybe it's the same type of deal where like West Virginia probably dialing up a little bit more heat because KU didn't handle that well. Or, but are you kind of surprised that K-State didn't try to bring more pressure like that earlier in the game? Especially when you consider, go back two weeks ago, the game at Colorado where we had a lot of discussion throughout the game and afterwards that K-State, they went to it so often that it put them in a position where they were having success without using it. And then they were getting burnt while doing it. And then you look, you know, they, they weren't bringing the pressure and maybe it would have helped them in this game. Like, but I guess, where do you think Joe Klanerman's head is at in these games? Like, do you think that he has so many thoughts going around in his head right now that he's kind of scrambling? I, I, I think in this game, it was a combination of KU has a good running game and KU has a mobile quarterback that likes to run it. And I think the fear is if you blitz too much um, and you get a gap wrong, they're going to break it to the house because of they, they, if they have the right run call called against it or if Jalen Daniels makes a play against it. And I think that's what changed that last drive. They said KU is not going to run the ball. They're not going to try to run the ball. Daniels is trying to get rid of the ball. So we're going to run this double A gap blitz and bring a linebacker and safety through the A gap. KU okay, can't block both of them, and then we're going to try to have our defensive ends contain Daniels on the edge, 
and he's not going to beat us throwing the ball. And I think that proved to be true. But I think there was too many fears of him running in the KU run game in general, the first three and a half quarters that they weren't, that Klanerman was, wasn't willing to take, take that risk. Yeah. And, and I guess, like you said, you know, K-State has done a, a decent job typically of kind of bowing up. And once you do get inside a certain spot on the field, it, and once the field shrinks, they don't give up touchdowns as often. Uh, and just KU was able to, to kind of punch through because I think, you know, there were probably some tackling issues and things last yep. night in, in KU. And they just had a, a better push at different points. So it's a concern for K-State moving forward, um, <laughs> especially when you think about the teams that are kind of left on the schedule. They're going to have similar versatility to, to KU once you get by Houston where you look. And I, I don't know what Arizona State situation at quarterback will be if Sam Levitt is back by that point or not. Um, so that could certainly change some things. But obviously they have Cam Scadaboo, so they've got the run game down. Uh, you think about Cincinnati, Brendan Soresby has been in pretty good control for most of the season, and Corey Kiner is a really good running back in the Big 12. Uh, and then Iowa State, up until two weeks ago, they did not have a running back. Uh, now they apparently do, and they have probably two of the best receivers in the Big 12. So uh, it, could, it could be some dicey matchups coming up for K-State if they don't get at least a little bit better and some of those things that we just talked about. Uh, all right, let's shift our focus real quick. Thoughts from the rest of the Big 12 this weekend and how things kind of set up currently uh, because there were uh, Arizona State and, and Iowa State did not play this week. They had buys, but everybody else was in action. Uh, the winners of the week outside of K-State, BYU easily beats UCF. Baylor, another win. They're now 2-3 and three in Big 12 play, 38-28 over Oklahoma State. And O State's now 0-5 in Big 12 play, which is wild to think of. Uh, TCU survives against Texas Tech, kind of the reverse of their game with UCF that they ended up losing, uh, but they ended up getting the win. West Virginia, I, I mean, Arizona is just as dead as Oklahoma State. Uh, I can't believe West Virginia with a backup quarterback won that game on the road. And then Houston beats Utah and Colorado beats Cincinnati. So, uh, Drew, you can give a couple of thoughts on the league and also uh, your your takeaways moving forward. Yeah, I think that the the big takeaway probably has to be that a lot of people, myself included, thought that UCF at least had a shot to upset BYU. And that, that's That's a long trip. For BYU to make out to Orlando and to really make that game pretty non-competitive for much of it, I think is really impressive. And BYU continues to have some kind of magic on their side that they just keep on winning. And I think that at this point, you just got to say that they're a pretty good football team. A uh, couple teams here that really need to do some, some searching. Utah. Oh boy. Like you, you, how would you not have a competent quarterback on your roster? Like, and same with Oklahoma state, like by searching, you mean searching for a new head coach because Kyle Whittingham is <laughs> going to retire at some point. Might want to just do it now. Yeah. Like, Oh, Utah and Oklahoma state got to have some shame because you don't have a quarterback and everybody kind of, Thought that you didn't if one of your guys went down, like with Utah. But holy moly, is Oklahoma State worse? And then uh, the other one, you have a quarterback and you have probably two first-round guys. Arizona, what are you doing yesterday losing that game to West Virginia? But that that that's another team that might be just searching for a new coach because, you know, Brent Brennan probably not cutting it. Yeah, I, th I think if you would have came before the season and you you would have said Utah, Oklahoma State, Arizona, KU, and UCF are going to be a combined four and twenty-one after each has played five Big Twelve games, everybody would have thought you were crazy. And you know, even after those bunch, and it part of this is recency bias for me, anyway. But KU is the best of that bunch in my opinion, by far. Like, I, I think they're quite a bit better than those other four. Maybe Utah. They're, because they're, 
Utah does have a very good defense, but they're bad, so bad on offense and special teams. Uh, KU is the one that can score out of that. So they are the only <laughs> like one that can score. Yes, it's it's pretty it's pretty mind boggling to see that. Um, I think Colorado did a good job of cementing themselves. I thought they were number four. They cemented themselves as number four. Although I don't lose a ton of respect for Cincinnati, I still think they're probably the fifth best team, even after that game. Uh, between them and Arizona State because you have that mix in the middle of three and two teams that I don't respect. Texas Tech, West Virginia, and uh, TCU. I'm like, I don't think any of these teams are any good, but they have the favorable schedules that they've just kind of beat each other up. So it's such a weird dynamic in this league, and especially because it's so not what we expected, you know, besides really at the top league, besides us. Nobody else is playing what what you thought they would be. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so weird to see uh, how this is is kind of going through. And uh, K State just gonna have to keep plugging along and see if they can make it out on the other side. And uh, if the wackiness finally gets to BYU or Iowa State, which after BYU wins yesterday against UCF, or any of you like less certain that that wackiness takes place. <laughs> I'm a little uh, less a certain. little bit. I am too. Go ahead. Because yeah, I was gonna say because the the team that I thought that might trip them up just can't get out of their own way with, with and that's Utah. Like even in a rivalry game, that game might be a disgusting game of like ten to three, but I think that that'll that'll be a game that feels like BYU like controls it. Yeah. I mean, I I think the team that could be the spoiler is KU, of of one of those top two teams. Yeah. And that, but I don't know how much fight know. do they have left. How much do they have left after after what they put forth against us? Yeah, they're they will be a a fascinating watch uh, moving forward to see because I mean they they could have a huge say in what happens in the Big Twelve race because they play Iowa State after their bye. Then they are at BYU, then home against Colorado before they end at Baylor. So they, in four consecutive weeks, are going to get to play the top four teams in the Big 12 or four consecutive games over the course of five weeks. Uh, They already lost to K-State. Now they'll get Iowa State and Exton, Kansas City. Uh, That'll be November 9th, the week of K-State's final bye week. Um, I I mean, I look around and, yeah, it's – it seems just less likely. You know, we 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 did race to Arlington a couple of weeks ago with our win play show. Um, I, I'm no different than what I was back then, although I, I have made a slight adjustment. Um, I have flipped Iowa State and BYU, so I now have BYU in the top spot because of the way that the schedule sets up because Iowa State, at the very least, has to play Cincinnati and K-State, two teams that we consider to be in the top five of the league right now. But if you look at what BYU has left, I mean, they have to play at Arizona State. But again, until Arizona State gets Levitt back, and we see what that looks like with him back in there, um, they're they're starting to kind of trend down slightly, and the rest of the schedule is pretty manageable for them. I just you're running out of time if you're K State and hoping that uh, Iowa State or BYU take a loss or two uh, that could help you out. Like this is going to be a little bit different than 2022 for K-State, where K-State had the benefit of Texas had already kind of screwed around and lost some other games. And so K-State had that margin of error where they could lose to Texas, who was also in the mix for the second spot in Arlington, and then just went out and beat some bad teams down the stretch like West Virginia, Baylor, and KU. Um, K-State has to go out there. They have to win out right now. That's, That's their only path to get into this thing. And the fact that you have to go on the road and do it at Iowa state, um, it just doesn't seem very likely at this point. So I'd go BYU, Iowa state, K state for my win play show in the race to Arlington. I, I would probably go. Yeah. I, I think it's, I was sta- either way you look at it. I think Iowa state and BYU are both above us. We would be the third place in that scenario. I do think BYU's got the better schedule. But I think they're also the m- more likely to stub their toe to someone you wouldn't expect than Iowa State, perhaps at this point. But 
Who knows? Well, you guys are lame. I'll go BYU, K State, Iowa State. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you being a homer, or you yeah. just actually think that K State uh, is a is that much better of a team than Iowa State that they're going to win out? I, I think that there's a a legitimate chance that K State could win out, <laughs> but I, I also think that the, that that last game will be just an insane battle uh, mm-hmm. going on. So. It, it's kind of just a vibes thing of like, you know, case they just beat KU for the 16th straight time. I'm not going to sit here and be like, ah, they're not, they're going to lose to Iowa State at the end of the year. Give me the clones, bring them on. <laughs> and then uh, I, I will say though, too, that just with how the Big 12 is shaped up, like there is a, a chance that case State has one of the tougher schedules in the entire country at, at the end of the season. Because you look at who K State has played on the road, Tulane is six and two, BYU's undefeated, Iowa State's undefeated, Colorado has two losses, and, and West Virginia, up until or I guess still, has only lost to a team that is either undefeated or has one loss. So you, you look at that and it's like, okay, th- this was a lot tougher of a schedule than we thought. That is true. Yeah, it's, I'm it's I'm going through. True. I was going to go try and uh take a look here at uh the like on ESPN's resume site. So, if you're looking for um like straight up strength of schedule for how they do it, uh K-State is only 36th. Um but if you go and look at strength of record, um and we've talked about this before like comparative to other teams, um the top strength of the record spot goes to Georgia. Uh, they have the number one strength of schedule, according to ESPN. Miami's two, BYU is third, Oregon fourth, Penn State five, Iowa State six. Uh, and then uh, you go down and look, K-State is ninth in their strength of record with their seven and one with what they have right now. Uh, the only other teams with a loss that are ahead of K-State there, obviously Georgia at the top, and then Texas A&M and Pitt actually um and if you go and look at uh, you'll also show you like remaining <laughs> strength of schedule uh case dates remaining strength of schedule there is 56 compared to iowa state's 39 so i guess that would be uh your kind of shining light but that i mean that is k-state strength of record better than uh indiana who still has not lost the game uh tennessee who's probably a pretty comparable team yet k-state dropped in the ap poll today to 17 uh meanwhile i think T- tennessee's up to seven uh it's just it makes zero sense one guy the the tulsa paper journal world or whatever it is didn't yeah, even have mason, in the top 25 mason young does not know ball yeah so <laughs> d y and i's boy is just clueless uh you you put two ball knowers together and you get no ball knowers i guess uh but K State better strength of record than Texas, LSU, Alabama, Notre Dame, Ohio State, um, whoever you want to throw out there. So that kind of illustrates what you have uh, going for yourself uh, and everything. But that's uh, I guess we'll see how it plays out. But yeah, the the top twenty five makes zero sense. And I <laughs> as long as K State beats Houston, uh, I don't know who I said this to, but like the AP voters are going to be in for a rude awakening uh, come the first college football playoff poll. Because all of these Big 12 schools that they are keeping buried right now are going to be much higher than they, mm-hmm. they've thought. Because in in past years, I mean, people I know freak out about, oh, the Big 12 is going to get boxed out of all this. Gene Taylor feels pretty confident that that doesn't happen. I mean, Drew and I talked to him at Big 12 Media Day. He didn't feel that way. History would suggest that's probably true uh, in terms of who is it that's going to be in the mix. Because K-State and Iowa State historically, I feel like, have gotten pretty good respect from the, the playoff committee. And I would imagine that BYU is going to get it this year as well. Um, so I bet as long as K-State takes care of business against Houston, K-State's going to at least be inside the top 15 of that top 25. And I think there are going to be some others, like maybe a Tennessee, that are like, whoa, 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 we're number seven in the AP top 25. Why are we number 13 in the, the playoff poll or something? Um, so it, we're only two weeks away from that really mattering so keep that in mind uh all right uh 
let's do this real quick. Any thoughts on Houston off the the front here? There might be some wet weather uh, down in Houston this weekend. I know that Drew and D.Y., we were talking about it today. Um, somebody threw out there, you know, maybe this is kind of a oh, you look past the game or whatever, coming off the emotional high of KU. I don't think that happens in this game because of the way that the KU game played out. I think if this was a KU game of seven years ago where K-State won by 35, then maybe, you know, you just steamrolled your rival. You had all that fun. Now it's like, oh, we get another crappy team. I think K-State will be pretty focused and ready to take care of business against Houston because they they probably feel like they should have won by more against KU. There are some things they need to do better. And in addition to that, it's a lot easier to sell that Houston might be a tough opponent when they just beat Utah uh, at home this past weekend. Yeah, I was actually going to say that I think that Kasich probably comes out a little bit more focused because they just beat Utah. And if if yeah. Houston loses that game, you probably worry about that being a, more of a letdown spot. But Houston coming off a win, I think, and we'll get K-State's full attention. And I do worry a little bit about the letdown spot. And I worry about the letdown spot more of in the sense of how you beat KU by winning by two than if they would have won by 35. Like, I'm the opposite of Mason and that. Of, okay, this was a really emotional win that you had to spend a lot of energy on. Now how do you get ready to play one of the worst teams in the league? But them winning... Uh, yesterday, I think we'll get K State's full attention, kind of get to see where K State's at, and you hope that you see improvement on K State's end defensively because offensively, Houston is less than good. Yeah, it's it's the worst offense in the league, and that's saying something because we have Utah, who doesn't have a quarterback in this league, and uh, uh, and I mean Houston's playing a running back at quarterback now. Mm-hmm. And- Chris, basically. Yes. Houston is considerably worse. Um, Houston is kind of like the the opposite of KU when it comes to the metrics because they are 35 spots below KU, even though they have one more win in both league play and overall, um, just because they're, they're so bad on offense. Their defense isn't great. Uh, they do a few couple things well on defense. Um, you know, you knew Fritz was going to have them as, as a defense de- defensive guy, as a decent defensive team. And they have some decent defensive players on that team as well. But um, I I think it would take a pretty monumental collapse by K-State to to lose this game. Um, You never want to look over anybody. uh, But but Utah um, just in many ways gave that game away. Houston didn't try to take it until the very end of the game and and then managed to do it. So um, I'm not – you know, you, there's always concern because you're playing a, a Big 12 team on the road, but it's a game K-State should win. Yeah, and I mean, K-State has managed much tougher road environments already yeah. this year. Uh, Colorado, West Virginia even. Um, so I, I don't think there should be any concern. And again, think about this. K-State played at Tulane this year. We know that the fans were nasty. We know that the team was good. Houston is two years removed from basically being Tulane. So you are yeah. going to a Tulane right now. I, I I don't think anybody should worry too much about uh, what K State will will try and do down there. Okay, uh, two fun things to close out the show tonight. We have Fraud Watch. Um, would you Would you rather do Fraud Watch now or save that for the end and do the other fun thing where you guys will be kind of put on the spot here? Well, what so what what is our other fun thing? <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> there have been sixteen straight wins over KU. Uh, we are going to do a draft of our favorite wins during that streak. So all but one game will get selected during this because we'll each have five picks. Uh, so if you'd rather me do Fraud Watch now and you guys can kind of brainstorm really quick. Uh, look, I, I've only thought of the idea to do the draft. I have not gone through and gone, well, you know, I really like I really like this game because of this. I don't have a big board in front of me, so I've not prepared more than you guys, but uh, you can take your pick. Uh, I mean, I'm going to just wing it on a draft. I kind of like, I like closing with fraud watch. I like making fun okay. of people as we leave. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Maybe. That sounds good. Uh, so let's just, uh, start this off. Um, fan has seen more wins against KU <laughs> in his life than us. So he can have the first pick here. Uh, and then, 
Drew and I, I think, have seen the exact same amount of wins against KU. Yes. So um, I guess I'll let Drew go second and I'll go third. Oh, I was so, gonna let you go and then second. We'll, we'll, okay, I'll go second. Uh, and then you do you guys want to do you want to snake this or do you want to just go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, three, two, one? Snake. I'm good with either way. Snake. All right, snake. We'll snake it. We'll snake it. All right, fan, you get your first pick here. So only games during the streak yep. are eligible for this. Um, we had to explain this to Zach Nemechek on Power Cat Game Day because <laughs> Mitch was asking for our favorite uh, memory or favorite game from that stretch. And he was he said the Jordy Nelson play where he burnt a key to leave. And we're like, well, that doesn't really work here because number one, K-State lost that game and it was not a part of the streak. So <laughs> Uh, only games over the last 16 tries yes. against KU. So don't get, you know, foolish with us and say, oh, 2002 or whatever. Uh, only the games over the last 16 seasons. So uh, you can take it away, fan, with your first pick. I'm, I'm going to the original, the number one, to, to, to lose to KU three years in a row, to have Bill Snyder come back, and in 2009 to win a very ugly 17-10 to 10 game. <laughs> I don't care how ugly it was to beat KU again after losing four out of five and three in a row was pretty nice at that time. Okay. And I have picked two, Drew. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> then I'll go the year later, 2010, because for everything that Fan just said 2009 was, 2010 was kind of like a do over of that because <laughs> now it wasn't just, okay, we, we finally beat KU. It was, Oh, we finally beat the shit out of KU again. Like, and I, I just remember like that being a Thursday night game may have made it even better to me because that was like the next day I got to go to school and just be like, heck yeah, K State just beat the crap out of KU. Like, that was the best feeling in the world. I remember during like, it would have been like second or third hour, of my seven, was that my seventh grade year? Yeah. Uh, so we had like we went back to the weight room and we were in there and they had a little TV and had Sports Center playing all throughout the day and so it was they just kept playing those highlights over and over again. Uh, so shout out to Joel Myers and Dave Lapham uh, for for delivering a 2010 win for for K State there. Uh, my first pick, we're, we're sticking with the early years. Uh, I'm going to go 2011. I was actually at that game uh, with some of my family that are KU fans. Uh, I was the only one that went in for the second half because I was having a great time in the first half. Uh, so I thought that that was a fun one. And then uh, we're going to go more recent. And, and this game is just funny for a lot of reasons for me. But my second pick, I'm going to go 2020. Just the, the hilarity of a punt return for a touchdown with no time on the clock in the first half. And then one of the worst passes I've ever seen a quarterback make at the D1 level by Jalen Daniels, who I forgot until uh, the Proud of the House video, which, you know, you always got to be tuned in for Proud of the House, uh, that he wore number 17 during yep. 2020. Yeah, which just looks so weird and, like, not a good number for him. Six looks a lot better uh, for, for Jalen Daniels there. Okay. Um, so, well, 2020 is a, is a good one. Uh, I think I got to go 2022 though, is my, my next pick just because of what it did for K state. It punched them through to Arlington. And again, that was, that was a good KU team that was getting better. And uh, it seems like over the last five, six years now, there have been more occurrences where KU fans think it's going to happen this year. It's going to happen this year. They have all this hype and everything. And K-State once again, even though, I mean, that was one of those, K-State won the game by 20. It was a pretty comfortable 20 throughout the second half. Uh, and it still was like, oh, this is a little too close for comfort or whatever. But it had just so many comical plays in it too. I mean, Deuce taking that screen, however many yards down the field, uh, Tim Brando trying to do, he could go, when it's very clear that Deuce Vaughn with his speed was not going all the way to the end zone there. Uh, he probably said, how do you do? Uh, 50 times or whatever during all of that. Um, but it, and the muff punt, K State goes out, flops on their first possession. They get the muff punt, and then Malik Knowles' very next play into the end zone. Um, just a lot of fun. Sammy Wheeler had 50 yards of separation 
uh, to where, I mean, Will Howard didn't even have to hit him in stride. Like Sammy Wheeler was sitting at the two yard line and just, yeah, so many great things from that game. So I go 2022 on there. Good, good picks. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to go against my, my norm is that I, I, it's, it's more more preferable to, to beat the Jayhawks badly, but I'm going to go with yesterday's game just because of there's another part of me that enjoys that this is the fifth time KU has led in the fourth quarter this year and they've lost uh, to it's, it's almost a salt in the wound kind of thing for their fans. I know that's, I don't want to be mean, but, there's part of me. I do. The, the mean. I do. The mean, the mean fan that usually is not very mean. I, I do enjoy that. Um, that they have to put up with. Man, we just lost the KU K State by two on their own field. We should have won, and now we're two and six. So I'm sure yeah. that makes makes this year even more miserable for them. Well, and you know, K State's gone through this dominant stretch. The only thing that was left to do was play with your food and, uh, you know, give a false sense of hope. And they've done that really well over the last two years. Uh, all right. You get a back-to-back pick here to start round three. I'm going to go my next one. I'm going to go 14 just because I, I, I think I like the 14 team for K-State. I think it was a pretty good one that gets a little bit underappreciated. Uh, but the the receiving and Jake Waters and, and the big plays – and to beat them 51-13, and I don't think it was really that close, um, was was a fun game uh, to look back on for me. Especially when that team the year prior had played just kind of a, a ho-hum, not really clean game in Lawrence. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm talking about. That was a 31-10 to 10 game that you just didn't feel great about. Um, but, yeah, that 2014 was a very good game uh, to go with that. Um I got a couple here that I, I, I will use or think about. Um, but I mean, I, I kind of got to cheat the system a little bit and I got to take the other big 12 title team and go 2012. Uh, because you know, Colin Klein getting to dominate KU at home. And, and the thing about that game is, I mean, it was 56 to 16, but for the first, however long KU was kind of hanging around, like they had, I think maybe two leads in that game, like seven, nothing, 14, seven, and then K State was able to just turn it around and rip it on them. Uh, and I mean, there were a lot of Colin Klein bombs down the field. Uh, so t- 2012 was a good one. Uh, and you know, kind of the the gloomy day that Manhattan had going on. I have just an absolute sick uh, pick for this next one. Uh, right, you're going to take mine. Oh, okay. No, we're going to 2015. Just that one is just sick because that K State team was so bad. And still won that game by 31. <laughs> and, and it's funny, yeah. like, I was looking at the, the box score and just doing, like, a quick of, like, oh, I wonder what happened in that game. Winston Dimmel was the leading receiver with one catch for 44 for K-State. And Glenn Gron- Gronkowski had one catch for 31. Yeah. And, and then uh, uh, Joe Hubner had two rushing touchdowns. Of course, Winston Dimmel had two as well. Uh, and then uh, my second pick. I'm surprised that it's still on the board. I'm going to go last year. You know, k was the last team to win in the old booth. And I think that that's fun. And, and to do it in the way that they did it last year, it is almost sweeter to me than doing it how they did yet did it yesterday. Because last year it was like the whole KU crowd was super into it. And it was a super loud and energetic crowd in, in Lawrence. And then to rip the rug out from under them again, I thought it was really fun. Yeah, yeah, no, I that that's a good pick. I I thought about 2023 on my last one um, because I know that some people have mixed feelings about Will Howard and everything, uh, but that touchdown run right there was just such a thing of beauty and the emotion that he had on it. Um, that that was that was an awesome game. My next one, this was the disgusting game that I thought Drew was going to take from me. Obviously, has very personal uh, attachments to it. It's 2018 because of my guy, Alex Delton, the Hayes hurler. Uh, that was the original version of, of last night's game, but kind of uglier um, where case they had zero business winning that game. And Alex Delton, that run at the end, his weird little like prowl walk that he did in the end zone. Uh, that was just kind of a silly 
celebration on his part. Uh, that was also the game where KU had a couple of plays like back to back that went for big yardage callback because of holds, and they had the the one player kick the flag and then try to stand on it or pick it up, like trying to hide that it had happened. Um, and then like that was David Beatty had already been fired, but was getting the coach. And he made a lot of weird decisions that you're like, you're coaching like a guy that doesn't want to lose his job. You've already lost your job. You have nothing to lose. Um, so I go with the 2018 game. It was disgusting, but it was special to me because again, just like some of these games we've talked about on here, it continued the streak. It, with this streak going on, I don't think it matter. It should matter how it happens. As long as it keeps going for as long as it can, you should embrace the fact that it's happening. And uh, Alex Delton, if he if he didn't run that in and make that play, we're sitting here and talking about. I mean, K State only won what that'd be like nine straight games against KU. That's lame. They've won sixteen straight now against the Hawks, and it's all because of Alex Delton. I, I'm, I'm next, right? I've got to go with what I will affectionately call the Harry Trotter game. Uh, 2021, 35-10 in Lawrence. Um, it was one of those games where the game was much more non-competitive than even that score just because it was like each team had six possessions or something. I think K-State scored touchdowns on their first five possessions of that game and really – dominated KU thanks well to, and and Dukes came out of the half they got the the penalty yeah. and then he immediately just rips off 85 yards yeah. just... but Harry Trotter had 90 I think I'd looked it up 92 yards rushing on speed option alone I think in that game so that was pretty awesome uh all right you're, you're you get your final pick right here uh to to finish off your your draft I'm gonna go with the 19 game in Lawrence, just because it was the the first win for Kleiman mm -hmm. over the Jayhawks in the Kleiman era, the first of six in a row. So to to see Kleiman get the the win and pretty handily in his first bout with uh, with David Beatty, right? Uh, nice, nice job. That was, that, that was Miles, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was that was, that was miles, miles to go. That was because they had that just miles to go. The week before, and so that was like the first version of, oh yeah, this is uh, there's like some excitement. Yeah. It's going to happen. The miles to go, yeah, and yeah. then it it ends with Les Miles taking sad timeouts to try and get Ben or Manny, either of his kids, yes. into the end zone for a final touchdown. Uh, so yes, that that absolutely uh, is one that should be remembered. And actually, so you you took <laughs> the uh, the 2021 game uh, because of this. But and you said Harry Trotter. Harry Trotter, that was actually the 19 game that he oh, did all that in. So you just, I mean, you got the the bonus right there. Uh Skyler it was the ran, game. Yeah, I had to mix, I had to mix it up. Skyler ran all over the place. There was the the one play where um I can't even remember if it was on one of his runs or if it was Dalton Schoen catching a ball, but like it, yeah. the jersey was ripping as they were going across. Uh Skyler ran for 127 yards and three touchdowns. Right. He did. In that game, uh, that was Tyler the game Curry Curry had 92. even got in the end zone. Yep, that was so. 19. I had him mixed up. Okay, so that is 19. That was where I was going to go for my last one if it was available. So I I I hate to do this because again, this feels like I'm just kind of gaming this situation. <laughs> uh, um, but I am going to take <laughs> Even though I don't like it because it was 15 points, it wasn't. It felt closer than it needed to be. It wasn't overly exciting. I'm taking the 2016 game because that was my first as a student at K State. But most of all, that was Bill Snyder's 200th career win, mm. which very fitting that it took place against KU in Manhattan uh, there. So I am going with the 2016 game to close out my list. To close out mine, I'm going to go with the 2017 uh, game where, again, 10-point game, so felt kind of close, but also like a hilarious box score because KU actually outgained K-State by mm -hmm. 140 yards and still lost the game by two possessions because what else is new in this rivalry? K-State made a big special teams play, and DJ Reed ran a kickoff back. 
And uh, just funny box scores from back then because K State ran the ball 43 times in that game and threw the ball 13 times. That was a that was a Tim Brando game, by the way, and we got a DJ all the way on the uh, kick return touchdown. So uh, there, you, there you have it. Seventeen and eighteen was the first edition of the gap is closed and gone and over, and Bill Snyder's gone, and K <laughs> State is going to do to nothing. And yeah, uh, we're kind of seeing the second version of that now. Yeah, um, I'm very proud of everybody here for 2013 being the game. They got left off. Um, that was what I was hoping would happen. I knew I I wouldn't touch that with a ten foot pole uh, because that that is the original disgusting game. The only and I I so I talked about this. Um, I guess it would have been two weeks or not this past week, but the week before with Scott Wildcat on Bosco's Boys. Um, he asked me for like my favorite kind of memory uh, of. K State KU and I was at this game and this was KU senior day and I brought up the story about how I had a friend that was also there with her family and she said it like at school on Monday she's like wasn't it kind of weird that their senior day video was to a One Direction song uh, and it was the story of my life thing and then of course an hour later that one One Direction member of the band died in Brazil in his hotel room or whatever happened and so I then I was like oh I got to apologize for being the reason that bad events happened to one D uh, today. So yeah, that, but that 2013 game was, was bad. K-State was pretty sloppy not very good. Uh, but John Hubert ran for 220 yards that day Wow! Uh, in that game. And so you, we talk about special teams having a trend in this rivalry. Uh, the other thing that you could find is there was a long stretch there where the tight ends and fullbacks, and really I guess you could say it's continued with the tight ends. Uh, tight ends and fullbacks have like had a field day against KU um, because that game in 2013, Zach Dr Trujillo and uh, Glenn Gronkowski caught touchdowns, and then you just kind of keep going through it and you think about all the different people that have found the end zone. Like we talked about Sammy Wheeler being wide open in 2022, or you know Ben Sennett had a touchdown to start the game last year in Lawrence. Garrett Oakley and Will Ancio were in the end zone last night. Um, those two things have seemingly always rung true with K-State KU is that KU is going to screw up on special teams and K-State is going to put a tight end or fullback in the end zone maybe multiple times over the course of the game. But uh, that is our draft. Um, final picks here. Fan gets 2009, 2024, 2014, 2021, and 2019. Drew gets 2011, 2020, 2015, 2023, and 2017. And I have 2010, 2022, 2012, 2018, and 2016, 2013, the only one left off. All right, uh, any final thoughts there, or are you guys ready for the fraud watch? Which, not a ton of movement this week because there was so much movement last week. That's fraud. Let's get some fraud. All right, I'll try not to die this week during this one, but... Uh, <laughs> No promises. I, I keep thinking I'm getting incrementally better, but I don't really know uh, what's going on. It would also help if I could sleep. You know, the best medicine is sleep. And then I got a one-year-old daughter that just decides, ah, 3 a.m., let's roll. Um, <laughs> so we'll see. All right. This is what it looked like last week. Just a reminder to the people out there. Um, I, I had serious thoughts about movement this week, but it's mostly going to stay the same. Here are the changes, though. We Dave Aranda, massive move in his career here to go and win two straight games and look like Sawyer Robertson might be the answer. Probably saved his job and a lot of other things. He is no longer in fraud warning. The category that was named after him, basically. We do this because of Dave Aranda, and here he is not as the biggest fraud in the league anymore. I'll be interested in watching very closely over the next couple of games. But Sonny Dykes, Joey McGuire, Brent Brennan, Neil Brown, Kyle Whittingham, Mike Gundy, if you guys don't get real quarterbacks, and Gus Malzahn join the party now uh, in the fraud warning. It And look, that may seem like a lot, but I, I think it speaks to just how bad some of these teams are performing in the Big 12 this year and how some of these guys now have a track record of woefully underperforming uh, over the course of a couple of seasons. 
And then Deion Sanders, I will say this. We already know Deion has moved up a couple spots this season. I flirted with taking him out of fraud watch completely. He almost got put in no man's land. But then the little voice in the back of my head said, he's just going to leave after his sons and honorary son, Travis Hunter, leave next year. He's just going <laughs> to let the program go to crap. And he's not He's not a real coach, all these other things. So uh, we'll see. Uh, but if something happens with Dion, um, he might he might get out of it this year. And Lance Leipold has moved back from no man's land to uh to the fraud watch because again, you can't just keep losing games like you have, and for this to not be on the head coach. Like you either have to figure out what the problem is as the head coach, or the problem is you. Um, and if you aren't figuring it out as a head coach, then the problem is still you. So Lance Leipold, in some ways. He deserves credit for even being able to be considered a fraud right now, but he is a fraud as we sit here, or at least we're watching to see if he's a fraud. Uh, Willie Fritz eh, starting to maybe spin the wheels a little bit more turn towards getting uh, some of that stud status back, lifetime stud status, but uh, we'll have to see. Um, if he lets K-State win by like 28 this weekend, uh, he can be a stud for the rest of the season. I don't really care. Um, and Scott Satterfield, I just don't know that he's going to be able to do anything to change my opinion of him this year. And I don't know if it's because I, I actually think he's not a good coach or if it's just because he looks like a generic coach in NCAA football 14. Um, just a boring looking white guy with glasses, uh, yet somehow still way better looking than Elijah Drinkwitz, even though they are the same person. I was, say, I was about to say, I thought that we figured out who he looks like. He doesn't look like, look like a generic guy. He just looks like Drinkwitz. Yeah, just a couple of App State clones of each other right there. Uh, and then the studs, they keep studying all over the place. Even though Mike Gundy and Kyle Whittingham, just get out <laughs> now before you ruin your reputation uh, because it's it's not going well down the stretch here for you. And the disappointing thing is for Mike Gundy, you would think a guy that likes to just have such a good time and everything, he's only 57. He's got young kids. He should be able to relate a little bit better and be able to – you know, kind of handle uh, some of this. He's not Kyle Whittingham. I kind of get it. He's 64, you know, whatever. Uh, he, he just wants to kind of ride off in the sunset. Things aren't going the way he wants it to. Um, so he should just call it quits, retire and everything. But uh, that is fraud watch this week. Uh, any suggestions or concerns moving into next week's fraud watch? I will take anything from you guys. Uh, I mean, I, I am proud of you for moving Dave Aranda up. I know that, that probably hurt a little bit, or, or or was it the opposite? Were you were you excited to move Dave Aranda up, or was this like a oh? Um, I didn't want to because again, like I've been such a banger <laughs> of the drum that he is a fraud, um, and he still may be, but I, it was deserved. Like I couldn't keep him there without giving him credit uh, for what's gone on the last couple of weeks. So. We'll see what happens. I mean, I think Baylor is one of the teams that we've talked about. Uh, the schedule is kind of manageable uh, coming up now. Yeah, they play TCU, West Virginia, Houston, and KU. Like, again, like we said last week, you can't spell bowling without a B, and you can spell it without the U, but that's because you, Baylor, are going bowling this season. So you heard it here first. It's happening. Uh, book the Bears for the Liberty Bowl right now. Liberty Bowl. My, my other thought is that those those seven guys in the warning, there's the fire is definitely underneath their ass, especially I think Brennan Brown and Gus. Sonny, you well, get off the hook this week for me because you actually won a game for one. It's Congratulations. so weird because you look at those guys and you think, okay, Brennan and you're one. It's not going to happen even if it should because there was no reason going into it to think the Brent Brennan thing was going to work. Joey <laughs> McGuire, you can't keep failing like you are, but they probably have a lot of money invested in him, and the recruiting thing might be his saving grace for one more year. Gus Malzahn and Neil Brown just got extensions. Sonny Dykes, I think, got one in a raise after going to the national championship. Like. I just don't know that any of those guys that are over there can actually like you can actually do anything about it if you're these schools, unless you're just going to get a boatload of money. And I, I know West Virginia has talked about there are some financial things um, that might hold them back from the Neil Brown situation. 
Uh, cause he, I mean, I guess he got an extension too recently. So I don't know. I, I, somebody's going to get fired in the big 12 this year, but it feels like, um, it's not going to be as many as maybe it needs to be. And I guess maybe start looking right now to see, uh, which of those teams K-State has on the schedule next year, uh, because those might be free wins if these teams decide to just run it back with the same crap that they've had. So like Arizona, uh, Baylor, uh, Texas Tech, TCU, UCF, Oklahoma State, Utah. Oh, so good. K-State plays every one of those teams uh, that has a coach that sucks next year. Um, So that's good news for the Cats in 2025. Um, But that's all I got for you guys on Fraud Watch. And uh, we can be done and uh, go on with our nights and get ready to start Houston week, if uh, that sounds good to you. Sounds good. All right. Well, then that will do it for us today on the KSO Show. Cats win their 16th straight over KU. So uh, it continues. KU still sucks. That's good to know. And uh, we'll see what K-State has in store next year. But first, they got to get through the rest of this season. And that continues this week on the road at Houston, 2.30 kickoff on Fox because the Cats are a big-name brand in college football, getting the Fox treatment against a crappy Houston team. Uh, Drew, D.Y., and I, we will be down there at TDECU Stadium this weekend. And uh, 2.30 kicks, so uh, just a heads up. Now we may just plan to knock out the Sunday show Saturday night sometime uh, to get that taken care of and over with. Um, Yeah, that'll be clean. So that way everybody – I was going to say we won't be back at the hotel at 2.30 in the morning. This Yeah, that's a nice little change of pace. That's going to be fun. Yeah, and we can get to the stadium at like, I don't know, like noon or something. It's it's going to be uh, it's gonna be odd because these road games have kind of sucked. Oh, there goes Brock Purdy running all over the Cowboys defense. This is just horrible. <laughs> I got to say, it really was not fun watching the Sunday night football intros tonight, and it's like Brock Purdy. Iowa State, and then they got uh, Danny Pooney or whatever his name is, the the right guard from KU. It's like just a uh, Fred Warner. I had to be reminded about BYU. It's like a whole Big Twelve hate fest for me watching the 49ers. <laughs> so not a fun way to end it. We'll get out of here. We'll talk to you guys next week with this crew, and then Drew D Y and I will have a bunch of stuff coming throughout the week. We'll talk a little basketball uh, over the course of the week as well as K State starts their exhibition and only exhibition game uh, was that Tuesday against Fort Hay state. They try to avenge Bruce avenge. Weber's shortcomings. Avenge. Yep. It's going to happen, which by the way, misconception that 2021 game was a regular season game against Fort Hay state. That was not an exhibition that was played. Yes. Um, just so people are aware. So yeah. if you're trying but to I say, think, has I, lost think was, I think it was an exhibition for them. Yes. Yes, it was, <laughs> it was very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man. Yeah. If you wanted a reason to, yeah, I, I'm not going to say anything bad about Bruce Weber. I've said it before. Um, I would still like to confront him face to face about how he disparaged my alma mater on his way out the door and threw a bunch of good people under the bus because he failed to adapt as a coach and learn that you have to put the ball in the hole to win basketball games. <laughs> the good news is Jerome Tang understands that because he's got Coleman Hawkins. He's got Doug McDaniel. He's got a bunch of studs that can put the ball in the hole this year, and the Cats are going to be much better than the prognosticators nationally think they are going to be. So that should fire you up for basketball season, even if it doesn't fire you up to watch the Cats just blow past the Tigers uh, on Tuesday night. So for Drew Galloway, KSU fan, I'm Mason Both. We'll talk to you next time.